My name is Jeff Morgan. I'm from Dallas, Texas. I am going to talk about the issue of the mandamus relief that is available when the trial court abuses its discretion and there is no adequate remedy at law. And this is based on the case that um, the writ of mandamus or the writ of prohibition, as it probably should be styled, and the emergency stay that Jeff Younger submitted to the Supreme Court of Texas. Well, just reading through the writ of mandamus that Mr. Younger filed, I saw that a trial court has no discretion, no discretion in determining what the law is or applying the law to the facts. There is no law that actually says we must transition a child. In fact, I know that we have been advocating against this because it, it's unconscionable. Nobody would even have thought years ago that this would be an issue at law. But, you know, you get some attorneys involved and they can make some money out of it. And, you know, Kuntz Fuller gets involved involved and Jessica Janicek and, and the gender ideologist people get involved. They find, they try to find a right that a child who was a minor child somehow can transition himself or herself. A second fact that I saw in the writ of mandamus is that the court must presume that a fit parent acts in his child's best interest. And this comes from the Supreme Court decision Troxel v. Granville. It is assumed that that fit parent acts in behalf of a child's best interest. Mr. Younger has never been declared an unfit parent, so therefore we we must assume that Mr. Younger is acting in the best interest of his children, his sons, James and Jude Younger. The courts are not allowed to intrude in that, and yet Mary Brown is trying to do so, and Jessica Janicek of the Coons for the Law Firm, she is advocating for that. And of course, there's a disagreement between Mr. Younger and Ann Georgilis, the uh, gender ideologist, uh, doctor, pediatrician. And, you know, so Jessica Janicek is saying, well, you know, we're just having all this big disagreement here, and it's, the court has to be the tiebreaker. I'm sorry, but in this instance, the court should never, ever, ever say a child is going to be transitioned. This does not fall within the discretion of the court, and that becomes an abuse of discretion when this takes place. And by the way, you know, Jessica Janeth thinks that we should be able to do this because um, Anne and Jeff are not married. And, uh, and, and actually, Anne and Jeff are not even divorced. Their marriage was annulled, supposedly, purportedly because of fraud by Mr. Younger, which another preposterous conclusion from what I could see, looking at the facts of how you go through uh, a pre prenuptial and everything else, it's absolutely preposterous. But nevertheless, um, Jessica Janicek is saying that, you know, we need to have a tiebreaker in here. The question that I have is this. You, as a father and mother in a normal marriage, an intact marriage, have disagreements about your children. One says, well, I believe that the son should go to this school. Another person says, no, I believe he should go to a trade school or, or whatever. How do you resolve that? Do you take every issue like this to the court? No, you resolve it among yourself. So why is it that when you have divorced parents or annulled parents, that all of a sudden you need to get the courts involved? This is something that family law attorneys like Jessica Janicek and the Kuntz Fuller Law Firm that have a lot of family law attorneys with them, they want to advocate that you need to get an attorney involved. Because at a mere $400 an hour for Jessica Janicek and some of the other attorneys with them charge a whole lot more, they will help to litigate this matter. And they will put it before a judge and the judge will is the super parent, as some people have termed, or as the tiebreaker, as Jessica Janicek would say. This is absolutely ridiculous. The court has no authority here. Um, the parents have the fundamental rights. Unless they are somehow uh, this decide, determined to be unfit, then you could say an unfit parent does not act in the child's best interest. A fit parent does. Mr. Younger has never been determined to be unfit. He is actually acting in the child's best interest as he sees it. And therefore, his best, the, the father's wishes should be respected. The third thing that I noticed is that the father's constitutional rights have been trampled, completely trampled. As I was saying, you know, the state has to actually justify its intrusion into uh, the family, uh, the, the, the realm of the family. And right now that has not done so. They're trying to say, well, you know, the tiebreaker, that, that's our justification. That is actually not justification enough. Um, there are the, the fundamental rights of parents is to determine the upbringing of their children. And that includes the religious teaching, that includes a number of things. They have a duty to provide and everything else. And the duty to provide can be moral training, religious training, uh, emotional training, and everything else. This is not within the realm of 
the courts, it's not within the realm of the state. So, um, but they're just telling Mr. Younger, here's what we want you to do. And Mr. Younger saying, I disagree with it. And every time Mr. Younger disagrees with it, they hold that against him as if somehow he's being rebellious. He's merely exercising his constitutional, his fundamental and constitutional rights as a parent. Uh, the fourth issue that I saw is that James does not have any of the abnormal medical issues that were listed in the Attorney General's opinion. Um, so for example, a genetic disorder or a lack of normal chrom sex chromosome structure. From everything that I've read, looking at the medical records, which were included in the writ of mandamus, there was nothing abnormal. Uh, that was there. There was no genetic disorder. There was no lack of normal sex chromosome structures. So without these two issues, providing, administering, administering, prescribing, or dispensing drugs to children that induce transient or permanent infertility is child abuse. And make no mistake about this, that should this drug treatment go forward, James will likely be sterilized, will become infertile. And he has the right as a child to be able to procre procreate in the future. This opinion was issued by Attorney General Ken Paxton, 0401, on February the 18th, 2022. And it was pertaining to whether certain medical procedures performed on children constitute child abuse. Yes, they do. Except in the issues possibly where you have a genetic disorder or the lack of normal sex chromosome structure. James has neither one of these. Number five, the fifth fact that I noticed is that the treatment that Ann Georgia seeks can cause physical injury that results in substantial harm to the child. It's emotional harm, it's physical harm, it's mental harm. Can you imagine growing up and saying, dear God, what happened to my penis? My, my mommy put me on these drugs that made my penis shrivel up and then cut it off later. That is abuse. That is mental abuse. It's emotional abuse. And, and if you want to see, take a look, look even further, this is one guy out of England, the UK. His name is Richie. I don't remember his last name. But he talks about how he, when he was in his mid-20s, decided to transition. And then he woke up to the realization of what he had done. He said he was a crazy person. It was something that never should have been permitted to happen. It still is a nightmare to him. He's detransitioned, but he still has the permanent scars left. Then we have Chloe Cole, who is suing the doctor that performed the mastectomy on her for medical abuse because she asked for this, fully aware of what she was doing when she was underage, the doctor did it. And she is asking, she is suing him for medical, and the hospital, I believe as well, for medical abuse. What Ann Georgilis is seeking to do to James and what Jessica Janicek of the Kuntz Fuller Law Firm is defending is child abuse. And what Mary Brown is permitting is child abuse. And what the state of California has passed into existence, SB 107, it is all child abuse. In Texas, children are being protected both by the Attorney General's opinion, both by uh, the, the opinion that was rendered by Jamie Masters, formerly of the Department of Family Protective Services. And we hope this session as well by law. Uh, the only people that want to have this take place are people that are really whacked out. These procedures that Ann Georgilis is seeking to do, that Jessica Janicek of Kuntz Fuller Law Firm is defending, that Mary Brown of the 301st District Court is allowing, can cause or permit the child to be in a situation in which the child sustains mental or emotional injury that results in observable and material impairment in the, in the child's growth, development, and psychological functioning. In addition, as I said, you know, the, the sixth thing that I notice is that the child does have the fundamental right to, to procreation. Depriving a minor child of these rights is child abuse. This is all child abuse. Once again, this child abuse is being uh, perpetrated by Ann Georgilis, defended by Jessica Janicek of the Kuntz Fuller Law Firm, and allowed by Judge Mary Brown of the 301st District Court. Mr. Younger is seeking to stop this from taking place. That is why he has filed a writ of mandamus, or writ of prohibition, and why he's asking for the emergency stay.